Good morning. Uh, we're going to stand up and praise the Lord. And here at Church for the City, we believe that God speaks and he's speaking to us today. So if you're a regular attendee of our church and you feel like you have a word, I'll be down here in the front. If you would want to share that, I'll kind of let you know the process by which to do that. Uh, I'm going to pray first and then we're going to jump right into the service. Lord, thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for just your son and the gospel and what that means for us here and now. God, give us hearts to praise you. God, I, I pray that we would avoid all the distraction, all the clutter, all the things that might hold us back from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here we go. We're going to sing praise. Let's go. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm short and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Because praise is the water. My enemies drowning. Here we go. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Here we go. I praise when I feel it. I praise when I don't. I'll praise cause I know you're still in control Cause my praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray Praise cause you're sovereign, let's sing it. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Sing it out. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. So I won't be quiet, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? I won't be, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? One more time, I won't, I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? But I'm gonna praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, Lord. Oh, 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 my soul. All right, here we go. We're going to chant this part. Let everything chant with us. Let everything that has breath, yeah. Praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. sore throat, just like hoarse from sports and other things, yelling and whatnot. And I had a bit of a headache and I thought I was going to pray about it and like ask God to take it away. And I was like, oh no, maybe I could just go take a Tylenol. You know, that's kind of a small thing. Like God's got bigger fish to fry. Well, I decided to pray about it anyways. And then I went about my day, forgot to take the Tylenol and whatnot. And I realized a little while later that my throat didn't hurt anymore and my head was, headache was gone. And so I was like, wow, like an all day I kept coming back to like, God literally answered just the smallest thing, and it doesn't have to be something big. Like, I started to try to convince myself that my problem was too small for God, and that he didn't care about something so little when he has all these other things to worry about. So as I, we were finishing up this song, you know, I'll take you at your word, like, God is for us, whether it's a headache 
or whether it's something huge. And so I just wanted to remind everyone that it doesn't matter how small you feel that your problem is, God wants you to bring it to him. And so while we're going into this next song, I just wanted to remember that. So. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb. your name.
wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Let's sing that again. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of Church, I'm, I just want to ask some questions. You certainly don't have to answer. I, I do want you to answer in your mind, in your heart. But where do you feel like you get your worth? Where, where do you get your value from? Do you look to temporal, worldly things to fill you up, to satisfy you? I know I'm guilty of it. Maybe the praises of man, what we can accomplish, money, positions, relationships. The truth is, if we have Jesus, we have enough. Yet we are just so prone to look to other things. Jesus did not say, I am the appetizer of life. Start with me and, and then you, you know, you can have your, your main dish, the side course, dessert. No, he said, I am the bread of life. And in that culture, bread was life. Is Jesus your bread today? Is he water for you? Or is he off to the side? Maybe getting your, your second best, your third best. Who's your first love? How do you find your value? Is your identity in the things you can accomplish? Or is your identity found in what Jesus accomplished for you? Church, I'm preaching this to myself more than anyone in the room right now. What would it be like if we woke up every morning and found our all in all in the Lord? Pastor Kalen says this all the time. If there's one thing God did for me, it, it, would, it would be enough if he just saved me. That's it. It could be just that and that would be enough. That is enough. 
So church, I, I, I wanna pray for myself. I wanna pray for you that we would be people who our first love is Jesus, that our eyes don't get distracted. He would be our bread, our living water, our Lord. We'd find our, our joy in him, our peace in him, our identity in him, our, our self-worth in him, that when we're dry, he would fill our cup. Jesus, you are worthy. God, as the song says that we are just singing, God, you are the, are, are the worthy lamb. Jesus, you chose to step down from your position in heaven in the form of a man and be faced with the temptations that we are faced with every single day. Yet in perfection, Jesus, you did not sin. You were tempted, but you, you did not sin. And you said, let me take the weight of your sin. Let me take your burdens. Let me take your anxieties. Let me take all that you're striving for and put it on myself and let me die for you on the cross. That you can be forgiven, that you can be whole, that you can be redeemed and that you can find all you need in me, son, daughter. God, help us to live with, with you in front of us. Jesus, would we keep you our focus? Would we keep you as our first love? Would we draw from you? Would we be filled by you? God, in, in times of desperation or, or in times when, when we're lacking, God, would we not go to the world? Would we go to you? Because you're the only one that satisfies, the only one that redeems. God, forgive our, our waywardness. God, give us feet that run to you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for making us whole. Thank you for being our bread of life. We love you, Lord, and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we're gonna sing that song again. And this time with Jesus as our first love.
when they were singing the first song that was talking about rocks or stones or whatever, um, the thing that came to me, and Mark says it's in Isaiah, and it's also in the Gospels, I know, um, if my people will be silent, then the very stones, they will cry out. And one day, a number of years ago, when I was a baby Christian, I guess that was a long time ago, 44 years, almost 45. Anyway, um, I was reading in a National Geographic magazine, and one of the things it was talking about was stones and rocks. And it talked about how um, back then they had those track tapes. Um, it was talking about how track tapes, one of the major ingredients in track tapes and CDs, probably at some point even in videos, was um, ground stone. And every time I listened to praise and worship music after that, I kept thinking about how the rocks were literally crying out. And one day I just felt impressed in my spirit to start making messages on rocks, not little stones. You know, you see those little pebbles people send rolling around in Walmart or wherever, and you get to pick them up and keep them. And it says, Jesus loves you on the back. That's all good. But I like big things. So <laughs> I found me a big old rock. And for some reason, I felt impressed to write on that rock. Don't lose your head for even a minute. You need your head. Your brain is in it. And this man who was there with his wife, his wife was coming behind his back and constantly telling us about what, what an abuser he was. But she wasn't willing to let us do anything about it. So he started coming to the office. I kept praying for him and everything. He'd hang on the Dutch door and he would look over at that rock and just quietly stand there for like five minutes or whatever and gaze at that rock memorizing what it said on there and i could just see the emotion and the torment in his countenance in his breathing as he was standing there and i felt that i was to remain silent and day after day after day for a couple of months this man would come and do this then one day he came to me and said that they were moving out the next day and he wanted to know if i'd be willing to give him a present and I, I knew what he wanted, but I says, well, that depends on what it is. I needed to get some conversation going. And um, he says, I come and stare at that rock every single day, and I think that needs to become my motto. Don't lose your head for even a minute. You need your head. Your brains are in it. And I knew that was my open door to finally speak. And I said, but you can't fulfill that motto unless you have Jesus. And I says, I think it's interesting that you came here every day for two months and read the message off this rock because scripture says that if my people will be silent, then the stones, they will cry out. And he says, yeah, he says, that stone's been crying out to me every single day. It's been crying out to me. And I'd like to have that stone. And I says, well, you go find me another big stone so I don't have to drag it home here. And uh, so I can make another one when you take this one. And of course, he doesn't know anything about the anointing and that the anointing was loosed all over on that stone. But anyway, I just want to say to you, don't be silent. You're supposed to be a rolling stone for Jesus. Not a Mick Jagger rolling stone, but a rolling stone that will shout out for God. One of the biggest things I love about this church is that it has bodacious people in it. People who aren't afraid to shout. People who aren't afraid to get into praise and worship, worship and let her rip. But we also have people who are not afraid to go into a holy hush. But you need to learn to know the difference. When is God asking you to praise him with all of your might, with all of your power, with everything that is in you, with everything within your being? And when is God asking you to move in that place of a holy hush where you hear the still small voice of God speaking to you? Don't make it necessary for just the stones people write on to cry out to you. 
you be the stone that cries out to them. In Jesus' name. Isn't the Lord good? Can we just give him a clap offering this morning? Well, well church, we, we do have some announcement videos, so you are welcome to sit. Once again, thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Church for the City, and, and please just direct your attention to the screen behind me. Good morning, Church for the City. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Before we continue on with the service, we have... What? No, you already had enough. Good morning, Church for the City. Before we continue on with the service, we have just a couple of announcements. On Thursday, February 22nd, we have our men's gathering at 6 p.m. And then the following evening on the 23rd, we have our ladies gathering for if table. Now that will continue on in the morning of February 24th. That's a Saturday. So you can sign up for that on the Church Center app. We also have coming up a church-wide cleanup. That's indoor and outdoor as long as springtime comes. And I hope it does because we are hosting advanced conferences. We want to have our building ready for use as other pastors and church leaders from around the state and the city come and join us to be ministered to. You can find all of these things on the Church Center app. What is if? If gathering began with three words, disciple a generation. And discipleship is what we are still about. We believe it is the way that Jesus said the world would change. Life on life, coffee dates, in living rooms, in local churches, studying God's word together, making disciples who make disciples. If God is real, then what? The reason that we gather is because we actually want to live out what we say we believe. We don't want to just say, yes, God is real. We want to, as a generation, come together and live out what he's called us to do. We gather because we need each other. We equip because we need to understand who God is, and we unleash you to your places because you're the most effective way to spread the message and hope of Jesus Christ. There will be a day when we are together in heaven and we're looking back at the work we did together. And if gathering is about this dream that we could make the very most of the time that we have to build the kingdom of God. church. Well, we've got a lot of good stuff going on this week. Remember, men's gathering on Thursday, if gathering for women on Friday and Saturday. And who can tell us if you don't know specific times or what else is going on, where can you look? Church Center app. Okay, with that, we're going to take a three-minute break and we'll be back for the word.
Amen. Well, uh, good morning and welcome to Church for the City. My name's Kayla, I'm the pastor here, and it's really an honor to have you join us today. For those that perhaps are participating online as well, welcome. Uh, wasn't this morning just pretty amazing? Yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Let's, let's give a clap offering to the Lord. Can we do that? Yeah, I <clears throat> just really appreciate the words. Uh, Josh, thanks. It was great. Thank you for leading us in that wonderful realization and remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. Worship team was awesome this morning, and I just couldn't help but think of David Swalley. You know, David hadn't been on the worship team. He's the one that played the electric guitar over here. Wasn't that sounding great? That just sounded mad. Yeah, it's like, it's like, like riding a bike, you know? You just never forget. So anyway, David, thanks for being a part of wherever you're at. Thanks for being a part of that team, and it was awesome. So as I was a young man growing in my faith and walking with the Lord, and there was a, uh, an evangelism class that I took learning how to share the gospel, how to share with people, how to present it, theological understanding of who God is, who man is, and kind of a process by which we would lead people, sharing with them what the Bible says about getting to heaven, and who God is, and who they are, and why we can't get to heaven as we are, because a holy God, a perfect God, couldn't dwell with a sinful man, not even for a second, because he's perfect and we're not, right? It's like putting salt water in a pool of pure water. If you put salt water in a pure water, what happens to the pure water? It gets contaminated, doesn't it, right? So that same, that kind of visual, but there was something specifically that we were really coached to talk about. It was this idea that whenever somebody, because eventually when you kind of share the perspective, you'd get to this question, understanding these things, how do you personally hope to get to heaven? And everybody has all kinds of ideas of how to get to heaven. I can be better, I ask for forgiveness, you know, I, I work harder, you know, I, on and on and on. And the reality is, is none of those reasons would get people to heaven. And so our job was to squash every excuse that they had. And the intent was to, it's almost, it's almost mean. <laughs> the whole point was to get them to a place where they were totally hopeless. That they would begin to see who God really is and the hopeless situation that mankind is in apart from God. And the whole intent was that the holiness of God should put so much pressure on the sinfulness of man as to break them that they would come to a place of understanding their need for a savior. And oftentimes we would say, you know, we're hopeless and the result of being separated from God is eternity in hell. And one of the questions we would ask is, does that concern you? It's a good question. I'm gonna read, and it's not up on the screen, but I wanna read the passage of scripture I started with last week. And then we'll get into today's scripture. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With, each, uh, with two, they, uh, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. The whole intent last week when we talked about that scripture was understanding that God gave Isaiah an opportunity to look into heaven, the throne room itself, at the holiness of God. And Isaiah in his day was probably on the top of the list of probably being one of the most righteous men in Israel. He was godly. He was a righteous man. He was called of God and being prepared. He just gave his life to the things of God. We might compare him today. I would look at that maybe as somebody like a Billy Graham in my day. A Billy, he's just a, he was just a godly, righteous man. Some people, especially in the Catholic realm, would think of the Pope. Right? The Pope is just this righteous guy. It's like he's next to, next to God. Right? That's kind of the perspective. I think Isaiah would kind of fit in that category. And yet, his glimpse of the holiness of God brought a sense of terror. 
His response was one of despair because he was forced to see his own sinfulness. Let's pick up the scripture in Isaiah 6, verse 5. It says this. When he saw that, right, when he saw the holiness of God in the temple, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I think that's key there, by the way. My eyes have seen the King. And when one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, and he had taken tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The doctor walked into the room of one of his patients. He says, I have good news and I have bad news. What would you like to hear first? The patient said, let's start with the bad news. How many people I generally go to, I go to the bad news first. Let's hear the bad stuff so we can at least end the day on a good note. You know what I'm saying? So let's, tell me the bad news. And, the, and the, the doctor says, I'm so sorry, but we amputated the wrong leg. I've heard of horror stories like that. He says, oh my goodness. Well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is your other leg is healing just fine. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see your holiness. The Lord God Almighty. And Father, that you would help us see really our sinfulness, who we really are. And God, that we would really enjoy it receive and understand the grace given to us today. So I pray you would open up our ears and our minds to understand and to hear what you're saying. Help me to communicate well now. And I pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said. I just want to start with this. There's four points this morning, but I want to start with this idea that we have got to see our need. We just have to understand who we are and our position in life and position as humans and position as individuals we have to understand that we have a need. That's why I think it's so important that when people come to Christ and they give their life to the Lord, what is it that motivates? I think they see their need. I think it's so important. I, I think as a preacher oftentimes, maybe from the pulpit, maybe in general, we maybe soften the biblical portrait of God. Now, there are times, I must admit, that I get uh, a little bit of pushback and certain people accuse me <laughs> as your pastor, preaching moments that I don't spend much time talking about sin. Should we start today? <laughs> no, sometimes what we want to do is we want to talk, emphasize about God's love. We emphasize his compassion. We paint his picture of God as a God that's forgiving and full of mercy. And oftentimes we will bypass things like judgment, Holiness, the wrath of God. Those are uncomfortable conversations. It's hard for, talk about hell. It's hard to talk about people going there. They feel like maybe we're judgmental or we're judging them or we're, you know. I had a, I had a share of the gospel with a, an older gentleman. I happen to know his son. And he didn't say this to my face, but when I shared this whole idea of putting that pressure of holy, he, he actually accused me of telling him that he was going to go to hell. And that was not the, that was not the, he, he got offended with me. It was not the intent. But I, I wonder perhaps one of the reasons is that we soften the message, either our understanding of God or what we want to know about God or even preaching about God. I wonder if one of the reasons is that the holiness of God is traumatic. To unholy people. I was reading a commentary and he, he labeled his message the trauma of holiness. I, I think there was a moment in there where Isaiah suffered trauma. He, 
I'm undone, I'm ruined. There's something happened to his psyche, something happened to his understanding, even physically, how it affects people. We see the response of Isaiah specifically, but the Bible is full of the responses of righteous men and women when they can, they're confronted by a holy God. The men and women of God of the Bible, if, if they encounter God in this way, I'm ruined, I'm undone, woe to me, how much more fearful is it for sinful people or unholy people or people that are far from God or when we're not living like we should and we encounter a holy God, how much more impactful would that be? This is what Habakkuk said in 3.16. He says, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me and I shook in terror. That's a righteous, holy prophet of God when he's encountered with the significance of the judgment of a holy God. How much more should we? I was reminded when I was preparing, I was just thinking about this yesterday even, but I remember the encounter that Jesus had with a sinful woman at a well. And he's just having a conversation. She's, she's living a sinful life. She's had five husbands. The man that she was living with now was not her husband. She was obviously living in sin in a, right, a promiscuous, right, unholy kind of setting. And, and he called her on it. She like, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> oh. But he said this. He, he asked her for water. She was getting water out to take back down to her home. And he asked her for water. And they started this conversation. And he said this. He says, if you knew who it was that was asking you for water. It brings a different element to the relationship with a holy God. As soon as she understood that Jesus was the coming Messiah, God himself changed the trajectory of her life. If you knew who it was that was asking you. I, I, I think about a particular movie, perhaps, or scenes that we have seen that people are a little flippant in some of the relationships that they might have with somebody, not knowing who they are, and they even hold the opportunity of life or death. And I think about Gladiator, Russell Crowe, and Caesar had in his thumb the power of life or death. There's a significance to understanding a holy God. There's a significance of understanding if you knew who it was who was asking you for water, how would we respond? There's a scripture in Matthew 10, 28 that talks about our Father in heaven. Jesus said this, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do we understand the holiness of God? I think it's crucial to our walk with him. I think it's crucial to understanding of who he is. So here's the bad news. I have some good news and I have some bad news. And we'll start with the bad news. Isaiah, standing before this presence of God, a revelation, encountering a holy God, had some bad news. And he says, woe is me. That word woe is grim and terrifying. It's oftentimes used in announcement of the judgment of God. Jesus accused the Pharisees, he says, woe to you. The book of Revelation is full of woes. That there is a time coming where the, where the wrath of God is going to fall upon the face of the earth and God himself says, woe to those that haven't repented and given their life to the Lord. That's a heavy word. That's bad news. I think Isaiah had an understanding of what it meant to say, woe, I'm undone, I'm ruined. I... As most of you know, we pray for the human trafficking situation in our city, in our country. And it was just a, a few months ago that the, there's an FBI agent that works with the Human Trafficking Task Force here in town. And he was talking about some of the results of uh, the arrests 
right? The criminal charges, the investigations, and really there's a lot of successes of some of the things that are happening in the, in the human trafficking realm, specifically in the area of prostitution and buying those things. And he was talking about uh, there's been a huge increase of buyers being arrested. Now you have to understand that the state of Montana has changed the law. And it is very serious today. Actually, the state of Montana's law, when it comes to uh, prosecution and punishment for those things, is worse than the federal laws. And he's talking about how he arrests these people, and it might be just attempting to buy, and they get, you know, there's the, you know, they get enticed. On, it's actually an FBI agent on the other end. They get enticed, they bring the money, they start the transaction, and they get nailed. They get thrown in the back of the car, and as they're driving to get arrested, the FBI agent is communicating to them the consequences of their improprieties. And he said, you could literally see the blood drain for them from their face when they recognize it's a minimum 25 years in the state penitentiary. Woe is me. There's a realization, an announcement of judgment, if you will. See, for the first time, this is what Isaiah, I think, really had an insight of who God is. And connected to that was now he understood who I am. And he curses come out of Isaiah's mouth in the statement, right? I'm undone, I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips. He begins to fall apart. I wonder if there was an emotional breakdown in that moment. He falls apart at this revelation and understanding. My question is, do we spend our entire lives hiding from God? The true character of God. Not unlike Adam and Eve, right? We know the story of Adam and Eve. They, they ate of the forbidden fruit. And as soon as they did, they understood that they sinned. And what did they do? They hid from God and they covered up. Yep. They learned how to sow. So that's where, right, the sewing companies started their business. It was Adam and Eve, actually. <laughs> Singer, right? <laughs> Right? They sinned, they hid, they sowed fig trees. This is our natural inclination, right? We don't want to be seen for who we really are. We are masters of self-denial and self-deceit. Just take a look at our Facebook posts. What would happen if we were exposed for who we are? What if we began coming up here and we just began to publicly confess our ugliest sins? That would be uncomfortable. You ever heard nobody is perfect? I used to say that as a kid. I used to play piano. I started when I was about seven, played through 17, took piano lessons every week for those 10 years. And everybody told me, practice makes perfect. I get tired of hearing it. And then I would just, my rebuttal was, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> it was always my excuse, right? My excuse not to be practicing like I should, or not right, working as hard as I should. And anyone, you ask anyone on the street, they'll concur. Nobody's perfect, of course not. However, this is the standard by which God judges. Perfect, perfection. Yet people don't seem too concerned about it. Ever track the consequences of almost, but not quite? Good enough for government work? According to some research by Natalie Gable, if 99.9% .9 were considered good enough, how many say that's pretty good for a human? 99.9%. .9 you got that? 99.9%. .9 then this year alone, 2 million documents would be lost by the IRS if they were 99.9% .9 accurate. If they were 99.9% .9 accurate, 12 babies would be given to the wrong parents each day. Those are pretty good odds. How many people want to be 
in that category. If 99.9% .9 were considered good enough, 291 pacemaker operations would be performed incorrectly. If 99.9% .9 was considered good enough, 20,000 incorrect drug prescriptions would be written. How many think that perfection is probably an important thing? I'm glad that God is perfect. Anybody else? Yeah. See, we're comfortable with our shortcomings. We're comfortable with our sins. We're comfortable with our mistakes. And we judge ourselves by each other and not a holy God. Sometimes when we blow it, have you ever done this? Inside you, something begins to, boy, you just begin to disgust yourself. Anybody? You sinned or you did something or you said something you shouldn't have or you made a horrible mistake. How could I do that? Inside it's turmoil. I can't believe that I said that. You ever wanted to grab it and shove it back in your mouth? Hello. Anybody married? Yeah. Guys? Oh, all the time. I can't believe that I'm that selfish or I'm covetous or I'm that lustful. Ah, what a dork. What a dweeb was the word that I used to use. Right? We're, but we're quick. Even though we struggle, even though we wrestle through that, we are so quick to excuse ourselves. Aren't we? We look around and always find somebody else worse than we are. I always kind of use this example. You're driving down the highway. The speed limit is 55. You're going 70 and somebody passes you going 80, and you get pulled over for speeding, what's your first response? Well, why aren't you going after the guys going faster than I am? Did you speed or didn't you? Do you deserve the ticket or don't you? But what do we want to do? We want to excuse somebody else because they do it worse than I do. Human nature. Listen to what the story Jesus talks about in Luke 18. It says, there was two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Cheaters and sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. Anybody want to volunteer your hands this morning? Didn't think so. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven and he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. We find a way to flatter ourselves like Isaiah until we're confronted by the holiness of God. He was a man of unclean lips. I think it's interesting, don't you? That's the one sin Isaiah focused on, was his mouth. I wonder if he had a dirty mouth, told bad jokes, swore, cursed perhaps. His tongue, it's a ruly evil. He even accused his people of having an unclean lips. His language. <laughs> Anybody feeling the pressure this morning? <laughs> Listen, we must give account for every word. But before I say, look, 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 we stumble in many ways, James 3, 2 says. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. That's in James. We must give an account for every word that we speak. Does, it, does that just bring a little different sense of, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to stand before Jesus someday and tell him every word I ever spoke. Listen, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on that day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Oh Lord, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I think every single one of us in this room can identify with that, can we not? Yes, if we bless God with our mouth and we curse men, we, we come to church on Sunday morning and we bless each other, we tell God how great he is and then we leave this room and when somebody cuts you off, what's the first thing you do? Right. We blaspheme God, we get angry, we get mad, we hurt others, we tell them off, we tell them what they think and Facebook is the worst. You ever hurt yourself? 
like with a hammer on the thumb, so it starts to throb. What's your first inclination? <laughs> we blurt out a F word or something, right? It, right? I, oh, Lord, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. But the Bible also says everything we've done. Everybody say everything. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Anything in our hearts, anything in our lives, right? Is there a particular area you think of as a dominating sin in your life as we read these passages? This is a moment of self-reflection. Is there anything that you think of as a dominating sin, or issue, or struggle, or fight? Or you constantly, it happens on a regular basis and you kick yourself. You... So tell me the bad news first and then we can get to the good news. How many people like to hear some good news about now? <laughs> See, we realize that standing before a holy God and recognizing the own sinfulness of our own life is that we can stand uh, before him based on his grace rather than our own merits. Josh really talked about that this morning. He really laid the picture. If Jesus did nothing else for me but save me, that'd be good enough. And that's exactly what he did. He left heaven, he came to earth, became a man, lived like you and I lived, totally sinless, and paid for our penalty of sin so that we can be atoned for and have right relationship with God. That is good news. And Jesus, by the way, his righteousness towards you is not 99.9%. It is 100% righteous. God's righteousness bestowed upon you we were talking about this last night. Mark talked about this justification. There's a theological understanding that when we give our life to Christ, we are justified in his sight, meaning we are made right, we're made holy, we're atoned for, we're made right with God. And I like this word, it's a great word to listen, just if I'd never done it. Justified. Just if I'd never done it. That's what God looks at. He looks at you as a just if you'd never done it. Hello, where else can you go and get that? What did he do? He atoned for you. It's called grace. Let's just give you just a basic definition is to cover you. It's to blot out your transgressions. It's to remove your guilt through payment. That's what atonement is. Jesus made a way. He paid for your penalty of sin. He wiped it out. He set your transgressions and sins far from you. He didn't say this. It's, it's okay. You really didn't mean it. That's just one mistake. Hey, you're taking yourself way too seriously. Don't be so emotional. He doesn't say that to us. But he also doesn't say, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did that. You're on your own. You blew it, man. You're going to pay the penalty. He doesn't do that either. <laughs> How many people are glad? <laughs> but what he does do is he takes a hot coal from the altar of God and presses it against your lips. Psst. How hot. I, I love spending some time. We had this last summer, even we just had some family time up, but. Georgetown Lake, and of course you do the fire pit, right? You do the fire and you roast marshmallows. And of course, what's the best time to roast marshmallows is when those coals are hot. They're almost a translucent orange. You know what I'm talking when they get that hot? I dare you to put your hand in that. Right, it's like the angel, right? The seraph took that out, that hot burning coal and pressed it upon the lips of Isaiah. How sensitive are your lips? You ever had a hot piece of pizza and bit it too soon and it burnt the skin off the top of your palate? <laughs> Will you right now allow the purifying work of God to touch you in the area of your life with a hot coal? Is it your mouth? Is it your language? 
Is it your thought life? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to burn it? Is it your heart attitude? Is it pride or selfishness? Is it an addiction issue in your life? For Isaiah, for some reason, he pointed to his mouth. For you, maybe it's something else. But I believe that the Holy Spirit right here, right now, wants to take that hot coal and atone you if you'll allow him to bring it to your life and press it against whatever that is. There's something about the confessional. He confessed, ah, woe is me, I'm an unclean man, I'm, dis I'm despised. He confessed his sin. There's a scripture in James 5, 16 that I think is really insightful. And the scripture, I'm not going to read the scripture just before that. You can go read that if you want. But it says that, the Holy, or that Jesus forgives you of your sins. He's the one that forgives us. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't get right with one another. And sometimes we need to ask for forgiveness. And we extend forgiveness. But technically, that's not what gets me into heaven. It's his forgiveness that gets me into heaven. And it says that Jesus forgives you. But listen to what it says. The verse following that in James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Not to God, but to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's healing connected with confession with your brothers and sisters. And what do we, what's the first thing we do is we hide. We keep it secret. It's a lot easier in a private room somewhere with me in a closet praying to God, confessing my sins, but as soon as I have to confess it to my wife, oh man, does that bring rubber to the road. You guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's a lot harder to do it in person. It's embarrassing, it's exposing. Sometimes it's gross, sometimes it's hard to do. But I'm here to tell you that according to the scripture, if you will confess your sins each other and you pray for each other, you will be healed. And just as Isaiah confessed, the atonement came, he burnt his lips and God brought healing to his life. The price of repentance is painful. The burning of that coal against that thing in your life is painful. True repentance is is honesty before God. It's coming out of hiding. It's being exposed. There's a scripture, King David prayed this. He wrote it in a psalm. He says, God, search me and try me. Find any wicked way in me. He exposed himself. And then confess and repent. I would like to take a moment right here and everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes and I want you to take a moment. What is it? What is that thing that you want the Holy Spirit to bring that coal and burn the cleanse? Confess it to the Lord. Pray right now, right here. Do business with God. When we come humbly on our face before the Lord, when we get honest and real and confess and understand that he is holy and we're not, he's God and master, he's Adonai, he's the Lord, he's the ruler, he forgives, he calls us, and he sends us. Isn't it interesting? 
Isaiah standing there before the Lord. He's in this room with God. And God says, whom shall we send? Isaiah's in the room by himself. <laughs> Can you imagine him? He's looking around like, who could I, who could? I guess I'm the only one here. Here I am, Lord. Send me. If God can cleanse that thing in your life that has been hounding you for 44 years, or 50 years, or 72 years, or 10 years, or five years, if God can do that, that thing that has plagued you all of these years and felt so much guilt from all of that, if he can touch you with a coal from heaven and cleanse you from that, set you free, blot it out, remove you from it, who wouldn't want to say, I want to be like Jesus? Who wouldn't say, God, send me, I'll go? Who wouldn't say, hey, I am available to be used of you, Lord? And I'll tell you what, Isaiah probably became probably the most famous prophet of the Old Testament, one of the greatest books with the most prophetic utterances of the Messiah you'll find in the Old Testament. God took a man that had unclean lips and he did a miracle in his life. He cleansed him and he sent him on a way and look what he did with Isaiah. Can you stand as if you're the only one in the room when God calls out and says, whom shall I send? Go ahead, bow your heads, close your eyes. Perhaps you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never become a born again Christian. You've never been forgiven for your sins. You're not sure if you go to heaven or hell, but you want to know. You're beginning to see who this holy God is, but you also see that he made a way. And the way that he made for you is about to happen. If there's anybody that would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be forgiven for your sins, to be cleansed and atoned for, please raise your hand and we will pray with you this morning. Everybody's head is bowed, eyes are closed. This is between you and the Lord. Anybody else? Thank you for that hand. Is anybody else I'd like to respond? Thank you, Jesus. Okay, anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is how we do it here at Church for the Cities. We, we just pray out loud together. For those people that raise their hands and want to make a commitment to Christ, this is between you and him. You do this sincerely between you and him, and he's going to do a great work in your heart and in your life. So let's repeat after me, if you would, Lord Jesus. I acknowledge your holiness. Thank you for your forgiveness. I admit that I'm a sinner. I've blown it. I'm not perfect, but you made a way for me. Please forgive me. And I admit and I believe that you died for me. You were buried and on the third day raised to life. I receive your forgiveness. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me. And I choose this day to give my life to you, to serve you, to do it your way. And I say no to the way I've been living and yes to you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go ahead and clap to the Lord for that. You can do that. Amen, amen. So just as an act, you know, sometimes you just look for a response. Sometimes just that step forward or just that response or that raising of the hand, it just sometimes it just does something. It's, it's almost, a, almost like God even just spiritually connects with you because of it. But could you maybe close your eyes don't look at people around you. I don't want you to do it because everybody's doing or not doing it. But would you, as if you're standing alone in the room, room with God and he says, whom shall I send? If you're willing, would you just stand to your feet? Hmm. 
I've been praying for months for breakthrough. That we would be a people that would break through and allow God to help us engage whatever it is he's called us to do. Purpose, calling, yielding, putting him first in our life, whatever that might be. And so, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these wonderful people of God. Lord, I pray that you would stir their hearts, that you would connect with them. God, I thank you for breakthrough. God, help them engage you. Help them respond to you, be obedient to you. And God, I pray that you would open their ears to hear the voice of the Lord as you would call, as you would direct, as you would speak, that there would be a sensitivity in their spirits and their hearts of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that whenever he speaks, we would respond as a people, as individuals, as a church, as a body of believers. And God, I believe that you have his a, a, a job for us to do. God, you have an agenda for us to accomplish. You have a city to reach. And God, you're going to use these people, this church. And God, we commit ourselves to you. And we say, God, send us, use us, because we understand who we are. And we're so grateful that you changed us, touched us, saved us. And now you're sending us. God, I pray for great success. And God, I thank you for the sensitivity of the spirit of God in our lives now. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being a part of Church for the City. The Stolbergs are over here to my right. If you have prayer needs, please get those needs met. You guys have a great week. And men, we'll see you Thursday night. Ladies, we'll see you Friday night. And we'll see all of you on Sunday.